Good evening. This is Assemblywoman Kadi Petrie Norris. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Facebook Live Town Hall. Tonight we'll be focused on helping our college and university students navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has been an unprecedented crisis and it has turned all of our worlds upside down. This is particularly true for our college and university students who were flung overnight into a world of remote learning and distance classes, uh, who face an uncertain future in the fall, and who are looking at trying to secure jobs in a pandemic-induced recession and a job market that, uh, that has shrunk overnight. We know that you're facing some really daunting challenges, so I'm really pleased tonight to be able to be joined by a fantastic group of panelists who will answer your questions and provide resources. Uh, I'm joined tonight by our Lieutenant Governor, Eleni Kunalakis. Thank you so much for being here. We are also joined by Dr. Angela Suarez, who is the president of Orange Coast College, and by Michelle Sequeros, who is uh, with the Campaign for College Opportunity. And we're also joined by Michelle Malari, who is the president-elect of the uh, Association of Students at UCI. So thank you ladies for being here. As I said, our students are facing some really daunting challenges and have some, some, serious, some serious questions. So I'm so happy uh, that you can join me tonight. Before we get started, I would love it if you all could just provide some, some opening remarks, introduce yourself to the folks that are watching at home. Lieutenant Governor, so good to see you. Thank you for being here. Howdy, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here with this terrific panel. And thank you, Kati. You have done an amazing job at doing these forums and, and being able to bring voices to your community uh, to make sure that people are informed during, as you noted, this incredibly difficult, unprecedented time. Well, thank you. And Dr. Suarez, thank you so much for joining us as well, for everything you do for Orange County students. Thank you. I, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and, you know, to share about the, the things that we've been doing at Orange Coast College, always keeping our students at the forefront and truly making sure that they have the support that they need to be successful and still continue on their path to achieving their, their goals. So I look forward to sharing some of that later today. And Michelle Sequeiros, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Campaign for College Opportunity and the work that you do for California students? Thank you, Assemblywoman. It's wonderful to be on this panel with the Lieutenant Governor, President Suarez, and our student leader, Michelle. Uh, I am the president at the Campaign for College Opportunity, and our mission and focus is to make sure that California supports our public colleges and universities, ensures that our students not only have access to go to college in our state, but that once they get there, they're supported to completion. So we're big champions for, for college access and really appreciate your leadership on this topic today. Thank you. And Michelle Malari, you are joining us as the, the recently elected uh, president of the, uh, is it the Association of Students for UCI? Correct, yes. So I'm currently a third year at UCI and I'm really looking forward to being able to share the student perspective of how UCI students have been handling the pandemic and what resources UCI has been able to offer so far. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, so Lieutenant Governor, I'd like to start with you. As, as one of your roles, you were uh, part of the Board of Regents for the University of California system. So can you give us an update on uh, you know, what, what's the latest thinking for UC's campuses as we, we think about planning for the fall semester? Well, Kadi, thank you so much for asking. There are 250,000 students currently enrolled in the UC system and across the state, across the country, around the world, students are asking that very same question. So uh, the president of the university, Janet Napolitano, did recently announce that every campus will be open. Uh, the question is, what does that mean? Um, I think it's important for people to know that of the 10 UC campuses, Every campus will be operating differently with their own protocols. So the state, the CDC, counties are all coming together to um, issue protocols of the best practices of how people can uh, be safely together. Mm -hmm. And uh, the campuses are taking those protocols and fine tuning them 
to fit their uh, specific uh, needs and, and, and their physical plans. How, how many rooms do they have? How many buildings do they have? You know, how easy it is to keep people mm -hmm. at least six feet apart um, to protect the uh, educators, uh, to deal with the situation around housing. So I think we're gonna see quite a bit of difference campus by campus. And I know that each one of them is working really fast and furiously uh, to come up with protocols that will work for them. One thing you may have heard is uh, uh, relative to um, uh, your campus in your district, UC Irvine, is that there continue to be about 5,000 students living on campus. <laughs> Most of those are graduate students. So I think that because graduate students tend to live in apartments, um, have singles basically, uh, because they tend to be in smaller classes, probably UC-wide, we're going to see graduate students um, the most likely to be able to be on campus learning in the fall. Uh, but then for, again, at UC Irvine, 33,000 undergraduates, a very different situation. So again, I think Irvine, the other campuses are really trying to figure out now through the summer who comes back and how. And uh, hopefully we're going to have those protocols uh, and those decisions made soon. Well, and I know our, our school administrators and our, our school leaders have a lot to do, as you said, to, to figure out how to make that happen. I, I think our students are going to be really excited to hear that they're coming back in some form. I know, uh, Michelle, I, I met with a group of UCI students actually just last week, and they they obviously have some apprehensions about uh, about the fall, but they were pretty uniform in their desire to come back. So what's your sense from, from the student's perspective and, and how are you being engaged as a student leader in crafting a plan to open UCI safely and responsibly? Of course, so I think there has been, like you said, a little bit of a mixed response too, uh, just because of course we do wanna go back on campus because that's, Part of the college experience is being on campus and with your friends and classmates, but also we definitely acknowledge that we need to do so safely if we do come back. Um, I do think that students, they, as long as we have the ability to learn, um, remote learning is a definitely feasible option for us. Um, but something that has been a concern is just not knowing whether or not we'll be back because not only does that affect maybe our decisions to re-enroll or to take a gap or anything like that, but it also affects our decisions for housing um, because we don't know when like our leases will start or if we should cancel them, things like that. But overall, um, as a student government, we've just been having to um, see what Taylor, our, sorry, see what the students' concerns are right now. So for example, um, is housing security a concern? Um, are students having issues? accessing basic needs, um, so things like that, being able to collect data on that, and then for next year and into the summer, seeing what resources we can provide mm -hmm. and reach out to those students. Great, well, and I think for all, for all of us, the, the uncertainty of, of this pandemic is one of the things that has been the most challenging. We're learning, we're, we're learning in new information every day and having to, as the governor says, we're having to, to make policy kind of in real time um, and make some really f foundational decisions about so many parts of this state. Um, so, uh, Lieutenant Governor, you mentioned that uh, the UCs are looking at some kind of a, a physical presence model. Um, some of the details are still going to be determined and uh, hammered out at the, the campus by campus level. In contrast, the CSU system a couple weeks ago made the decision that for the fall they would be in a virtual environment. Can you just talk a little bit about what, what our CSU students can expect next year? Sure, and of course I should have mentioned that um, the, the vision is that for those students who cannot physically be on campus for whatever reason, either they have an underlying health condition or uh, they, um, uh, there's not enough room for everyone, again, depending on the campus, uh, that uh, distance learning has taken a great leap forward. There is no question about it, that where we were uh, several months ago and where we are today in terms of distance learning, whether it's in public higher education 
or in uh, uh, high school and elementary school is a completely different place. So um, for the CSUs, what they've said, and, and by the way, this, the number of students, as I mentioned at the UC is about 250,000. It's almost 500,000 students in the CSU system across 23 campuses. And uh, Chancellor Tim White said several weeks ago, we just have to bite the bullet and recognize that we're gonna be primarily online uh, for the CSUs this fall. So he took that decision early. Uh, in uh, many ways, that's actually been really helpful to be able to create the best possible online learning environment by um, preparing and training uh, teachers and uh, by helping to bridge the gap, um, the equity gap when it comes to technology. So um, to give you an idea uh, of the magnitude of this shift, the CSU had about 7,000 courses that they offered online before the pandemic hit. In the course of about three weeks, they took another 72,000 courses and put them online so students could finish the semester. That's amazing. Absolutely unprecedented. Many schools like Fresno, for instance, gave out 1,500 hotspots, uh, gave out 3,000 loaner iPads. So there's been um, a very furious effort to um, to to bridge the technology gap because again there are so many uh, people who do, who aren't equipped for it uh, and also to make sure that the uh, that the courses are a good quality but I, but I will say this in this debate uh, Michelle as you mentioned uh, the experience of the online college versus in person. I, I happen to agree. I think that the in-person experience is really, really important. So I think that if you draw the lens back on the on the the the, the next six months, eight months, twelve months, the hope here is that this is a, a temporary situation, and that uh, we're talking about hopefully just the fall semester. Um, and that's certainly uh, my hope. And so that for students already enrolled, this will be an anomaly in their, in their experience in public higher education in California. And Dr. Suarez, so we have uh, two community colleges in the 74th Assembly District, Orange Coast, where you're the president, and also Irvine Valley College. Um, can you tell our, our local community college students what, what should they expect for the fall semester? So much of what the Lieutenant Governor mentioned uh, in relation to the UC and some of the work that was done, uh, you know, it, it was, um, Orange Coast College has been closed since mid-March, um, our Coast District, and uh, that includes Golden West and Coastline as well. And, you know, when I hear about 72,000 courses being, being um, transitioned to distance education, um, our faculty have done such a uh, monumental work in trying to do the same thing. You know, Orange Coast College has been, uh, is a destination college. Our community colleges, uh, you know, they, they, are, they have a vibrant experience on campus where you actually you know, engage students. And so moving that to online, it certainly comes um, at, uh, at a lot of uh, work. So our faculty, we have about 800 faculty members who transitioned about uh, 2,000 sections of classes uh, for about 20,000 students in about two weeks. So I mean, I just really, um, you know, when we talk about the magnitude, it really has been significant. So I think some of the things that uh, the community colleges, and I know Irvine Valley has been doing that, Orange Coast College has been doing that, is really looking not only at um, the, the community online, but also trying to um, focus on creating that sense of connection, knowing that we're not on campus. And with that, also making sure that our students, especially, especially our most vulnerable students, we know that many of our students have brothers and sisters who are home as well. They have parents who may be working at home or not working at all, so that adds to the stress. But being sensitive to the kind of challenges that they have at home, um, do they have a quiet place to study? Do they have, they may have access to um, the internet, but they may not have the broadband that they need to do their work. So similar to um, you know, what the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, we too look at ensuring that our students have the tools that they need to be successful, the devices, the hotspots. In addition to that, many of our students used um, our food pantry, our pirate, the Pirate's Cove, on a regular basis. 
So we made sure that we connected with our students and provided them with uh, grocery cards, um, making sure that our students have access to counseling. Um, and being at home at this time, it's, it's very isolating. It creates a lot of stress. Again, making sure that they have those, those services. So similarly, we also announced that our summer session and our fall session will be primarily online uh, and, and offered remotely. And that we're also looking at many of our programs, um, those that require hands-on learning, our labs, we're looking at how to bring some of that, um, some of those experiences back on campus in a way that is safe. And so of course we're looking, we're working on a lot of those protocols as well, but recognizing that you know we all want to come back together and come back on campus. Right. Yes. When it when we when we can safely and when we can responsibly, and I know that uh, that your team has really gone above and beyond to ensure that there's been continuity of learning for our students. And as you said finding ways to continue to build that sense of community. Um, as I said, we've, we've all just experienced tremendous challenges, and I think that's been especially heightened for so many of our college students. Ms. Sakura, I would just love your view on, um, you know, some of the things that have, have really been powerful in terms of helping our students bridge this gap um, throughout this period. Well, I, you know, I think as Dr. Suarez spoke, you know, our, our college leaders and faculty have really done Herculean work to transition to online instruction. Uh, you know, what we are hearing from students, however, is that, you know, many students don't have good, reliable Wi-Fi broadband access. Some may not have the laptop or computer with the right system requirements in order to actually access platforms that their college or university is, is using. And so I think there's very real time concerns about how do we support students adequately? Dr. Suarez also talked about just the, the things happening outside of education that are affecting student learning, right? When you have siblings that are home um, that maybe require homeschooling support, when you have a loss of income and jobs and now you have monetary stress in your household, and many, not all students are fortunate um, to have a quiet space to be able to dedicate to instruction. So I think our, our students right now are facing an incredible challenge. Um, and I think those concerns, not only about delivering online instruction, but also thinking about the actual success of online learning from the user perspective, uh, and I think there's a lot of innovation happening. There are colleges that are parking Wi-Fi buses. I think we should, we, I think it's long overdue that we have a real conversation about the reality that Wi-Fi and technology today for both K-12 and higher ed is more important than pen and paper. And we should provide it to all students who don't have the monetary means to access it themselves. Right, and I think, yes, the, the importance of the digital divide, I think, has been so heightened um, throughout throughout this pandemic. And I do think the state has been able to do a lot to help bridge that gap. Um, and there's certainly more that, that we can do and that we need to do. And, um, you know, and I love, I think, that the Campaign for College Opportunity, you're in such a good position to help, uh, I think, identify and help spread kind of best practices and learnings that are happening on one campus that, that can be really helpful to, to others. Um, so uh, just, was it last week that uh, the UCs announced that they are eliminating SATs and ACTs for admission? Um, so that was a big decision, a big announcement. Um, Lieutenant Governor, I'd love, love your thoughts, and then Ms. Sakaris, your thoughts on that as well. Sure, um, yes, for anyone out there who did not hear, uh, for the coming year, applicants to the University of California, it will not be required that uh, student applicants submit their SAT or ACT scores. Uh, it's a choice, they can do it if they'd like to, um, but uh, they're not going to be required. And after two years, the University of California will go test blind. Uh, so these will no longer be a requirement um, for admission to the UC system. Uh, a little bit of context for the decision for those um, who didn't follow it super closely. The fact is several months ago, the college uh, testing um, board 
basically said, we, we're not going to be able in light of COVID-19 to offer the test to everybody. And that created this really unexpected opportunity where um, since in fact, it wasn't a choice anymore. We were going to have to allow them to be optional because too many student applicants were not going to be able to provide the test scores. And I think that that really just set off a cascade um, of uh, a conversation that if we can go for a year in our admissions at the UC without having students necessarily submit scores, does that mean that in fact, it is not necessary for our admissions process to have the ACTs and the SATs as a test, as a, a data point. You know, um, these tests have been very controversial for a long time. I'll give you just one data point. Um, again, there are just mountains of information about, you know, on both sides of this argument. Uh, but the fact is that in California, of graduating seniors who applied to college, about 55% of white students um, scored over 1,200. About 45% uh, of Asian students scored over 1,200. About 10% of African American students apply, uh, scored over 1,200. And about 12% 12 of Latino students uh, scored over 1,200. That kind of discrepancy uh, I think makes it pretty clear that there is a lot going on with these tests that is not accurately measuring the ability of a student to succeed in college. And uh, we had been working around this for a long time. I think that the importance of those test scores had really diminished in public higher education in the state of California. However, this was an opportunity to take that big leap and to say, you know, all of the things that go along with those tests, uh, the anxiety, the, uh, the signaling to students who is or isn't smart enough or good enough, you know, that all can go away and we can approach admissions in a way that will most certainly continue to evaluate whether or not a student is college ready and whether or not a student is, uh, uh, it is the right fit for them to be accepted we can do it without those test scores. So it was huge news and will be very interesting to see how it plays out over the course of the next few years. And then Ms. Ms. Sakaris, your thoughts? Well, you know, it was a historic decision. We were very supportive of having the University of California drop use of the SAT, ACT. The reality is that those tests have never measured the total aptitude or intelligence of anyone or the ability of students to actually succeed in higher education. Uh, and so I think it is a, a good step forward. And let's be really honest, you know, the SAT ACT is a shortcut for colleges and universities that don't want to do the much better job of a holistic review of an applicant to an application. The idea that a three hour test on a Saturday could measure any of our intelligence or performance or possibility to succeed in college is, is truly laughable. And, and obviously, the fact that it has disproportionately excluded uh, low income students in particular. So when you think about the billion dollar industry that is test prep for SAT, ACT, the amount of stress on families that feel that on top of like just barely getting by, we've got to hire a tutor for our kids. We've got to pay thousands of dollars to make sure our kids can score on this test that doesn't even measure what you're learning in school. It actually measures a, a, a blanket of other things as well. So, um, so I think this is just good news for California families and, and appropriate news for the University of California to really lead the way nationally. And I saw, um, Ms. Malari, I saw you nodding your head as well. So it was the reaction amongst, amongst your students. Mm -hmm. A lot of students were actually really happy to hear that the incoming students wouldn't have to face this issue of having to take a test that, um, as has been mentioned earlier, um, sometimes it's just not as accessible for certain students. And, it has created a barrier for underrepresented students to get the opportunity to attend higher education. So we're really glad to hear that the SAT and the ACT um, are not required right now. And um, you know, what are your views on, on how COVID-19 
could affect uh, college applications and admissions outside of outside of this this pretty uh, fundamental change. And you know, Dr. Suarez, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think that this is um, a time when um, you know students and our community are going to once again look at the community college as being that. Um, playing that critical role to truly get our uh, economy economy back on track. Um, so I do believe that we will have um, you know, these students and the community turn to um, the application at the, you know enrolling at the community college. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, we are you know, very um, knowing that we will play a critical role in that um, in that recovery. Uh, we're also looking to make sure that we get the appropriate funding to be able to do that. But I, I do think that our enrollment will certainly uh, be increasing. Right, and that is what we saw, and that's what we saw in in the the Great Recession um, was that we saw a huge spike in enrollment at community colleges for uh, not just for new students, but I think for returning students and for students that were kind of mid work and looking at that as a really powerful way. To, to increase their prospects. Um, so I think that it will be interesting to see that again here. And uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, any other thoughts you have in terms of the impact this crisis might have on, on applications and admissions? Um, well, uh, let me just say that when it comes to financial aid, that's gonna be a big part of whether or not students matriculate. And Kati, that is in your hands. Uh, the governor has proposed in the budget revised with dramatic cuts everywhere, a very difficult situation, but he's proposed leaving the Cal Grant funding the same. Uh, so I hope that you and your capacity as a lawmaker and your um, process of passing a budget uh, will support that. Uh, a, little, a little lobbying here since we're, <laughs> since we're all together. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing though that uh, students will be able to do is if they um, have applied already for financial aid, if they're an incoming st a student who's already uh, been at school and, and, and had the opportunity to, to apply for and receive financial aid, if their family's financial condition has changed, they have the opportunity now to go in and revise their student aid application and potentially get additional uh, support. So that's important. Well, and Lieutenant Governor, you mentioned the, the, the budget, and as, as I think you all know, we are, are facing a pandemic-induced recession and a budget deficit uh, that is estimated by the governor's team to be $54 billion. We actually just had a um, assembly hearing yesterday in, in a committee of the whole to review the budget. And I can tell you that, that both for me and I think for every colleague that spoke, I think that we recognize that education isn't, isn't just the most important role that, that our government plays, but it's the most important investment that California can make. And it's not, it's not, just, it's not just a line item, it's, it's an investment in the future of our kids and the future of California and ultimately the future growth of this economy. Um, so I think we are very committed to doing everything we can to, to, to preserve that and you know, appreciate your, your leadership and commitment there as well. Um, so you know, to this subject of, of college affordability, we know that COVID-19 has introduced new financial stresses on, on so much of our community. Um, you know, Ms. Sikiros, can you talk about kind of any, uh, any flexibility, and Lieutenant Governor, you mentioned some of it, but any other flexibility around financial aid for our, for our incoming students or for current students that are grappling with how are they going to make this work? Yeah, I think the, that the Lieutenant Governor put it really nicely. I, I think all of your constituents and students in college or thinking about college should know that they can uh, revise their student aid application so that they can access more aid. I think preserving financial aid in the state budget is going to be critical. The one area that was proposed as a cut was the Cal Grant to California students attending independent colleges and universities. That's very disturbing at a time when we know our UCs don't have the capacity to serve all students. So I would urge you, since we're lobbying <laughs> uh, in real time, you know, to protect 
uh, financial aid for all students um, attending our nonprofit independent colleges and universities, of which you have some in your district. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that becomes really critical and important. But I think the awareness, um, you know, my biggest concern, Assemblywoman, is, is the reality that we may see students decide not to enroll in college mm -hmm. and that those who are most vulnerable, low income, may actually never then reconsider the opportunity to enroll. So while folks, you know, um, who are more fortunate can talk about a gap year for our students, um, the reality is that a gap year for someone struggling to survive uh, is, is not um, a likely possibility. And so I think really ensuring, to your point, the investment in higher education that the state makes, especially at this time when jobs are going to be hard to come by, right, um, when we're facing this recession, the best we can do is urge students to, to stay in college, to say yes to college. Um, that, that is um, the best that we can do as well as preserving financial aid for them. Well, and I think ensuring that we do everything we can to connect students with the, the financial aid and the resources that are available. And I'm sure Dr. Flores, you, you've experienced this as well. There are, I think there's, there's tons of money and often tons of federal money that gets left on the table because our students and some of their parents don't know about what is out there and what's available. Um, and so I think, yes, we need to do a better job of ensuring that we're not, we're not leaving, leaving money on the table. Um, and Dr. Suarez, any, any thoughts you have in terms of the impacts that the revised budget is going to have on college affordability and, and what we can do to help close that gap for, for our California kids? Well, I think, as I, I mentioned earlier today, I think that, um, you know, students are going to, students are going to turn to the community colleges um, as, as, you know, we're there to support our communities. I think part of our challenge will be having the resources to be able to offer those, those sections and those courses that will support the recovery of our, of our communities. And so it's, I think, whatever can be done in terms of providing the appropriate budgeting to our colleges to be able to do that, I think that would be the most uh, important for us. Um, you know, we're well positioned to do that. And I was just, I was thinking about, um, you know, when we're talking about the resources for students. One of the things that, um, you know, let's say Orange Coast College, we have, we call it our, our Pirates Promise. And that's, you know, for all high school graduates, they have a, they will have two, year of, two years of free tuition. I mean, how exciting is that? And getting that information out to the parents and letting them know, come now, you can start early, start in the summer. But again, we want to make sure that we're able to offer the, the support that students need through the instruction so that we're able to, um, to again, serve that critical role. And um, we've just got a question from, uh, from Facebook. So what will happen to tuition at the, the UC and CSU level? I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, look, um, no, I, I don't want to be glib about this because um, we are going to have some really tough decisions. Kati, you're going to have some tough decisions uh, to make in um, passing the budget and making some pretty significant cuts. But back in uh, 2008 with the recession, when the recession hit, <clears throat> the cuts came deep and the response of the UC and the CSU was to dramatically raise tuition. And it has been disastrous for families in this state, particularly middle-class families in this state, because we've had with economic recovery, enough funds going in to really help give that financial aid to lower income students. But students in the middle class, these families still doesn't have the kind of disposable income to be able to pay for more expensive uh, college uh, uh, in the state really took a big hit. So it's going to be very important as we look at how to continue to provide uh, the CSU and UC and community college education in this state. Again, three point, with about three million students currently enrolled in public higher education in the state of California. Assemblywoman, it's just as you said, this is the greatest investment in the future of our state and the future of our economy is investment in public higher education. But there are going to be some big challenges to overcome. Already there are uh, reported um, 
uh, shortfalls in this year's budget at the CSU and the UC of potentially hundreds of millions of dollars. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on tuition. I've been very vocal about this. It is absolutely not the answer. We have got to get creative. We've got to look at other ways to be able to fund our higher education in this state than raising tuition. So you're going to hear me be very vocal about it. I'm sure others as well, uh, including people probably right in this Zoom call. Uh, but, uh, but it's very, very important that, uh, that, that tuition not be increased this time during this uh, COVID-induced recession. And uh, so, so Ms. Sikaros, any kind of other advice, and I think we've gotten some, some good points, but any other advice that you would give to high school students or even transferring community college students who are trying to figure this out? Are there particular resources or websites that, that you think are high quality and give good information? Oh, such a great question. I just want to um, echo the Lieutenant Governor's um, comments around tuition and, and share that uh, her proposal to get creative around finding a way to avoid tuition increases for our families, especially in light of this environment, is absolutely the way to go. And I hope we can have a really thoughtful conversation with our system leaders, know, knowing that we um, are not ignoring the reality of what the deep budget cuts and, and implications of this recession are having. Um, as for students, I think, you know, the California Student Aid Commission website for financial aid support, you know, the system offices, each of them have COVID-19 related um, web pages. So the California Community College Chancellor's Office, the Cal State University System Office webpage and the University of California all have pretty robust sort of information. Michelle at UCI, I wonder if, if you would also kind of chime in on this answer because I think that there are there are a lot of resources. I think the question is sometimes there's so many that it can be very overwhelming for students and families. Great. Yeah, M Michelle, if there, are, if there are resources that have been good for you or good for your friends and colleagues, um, would love to be able to share those as well. Definitely. Some of the things that students have been able to take advantage of was definitely the CARES Act. Um, students were really excited when they saw that come through um, and help pay for anything from books to their rent or food, anything like that. Um, some things that the student government has also done was we reallocated some of our own fees into grants to um, students as well. So we had three separate grants. Um, all of them, if you sum them in total, it was about 200K that we were able to give back to students through grants. So that was a really um, helpful way um, to aid our students. I would remember if I may add to that, because I think that um, we talked earlier about there's so many different websites that um, make it oftentimes a little daunting for our students to kind of go through all of that. One of the things that I know, um, you know, the, the California Community Colleges Chancellor's Office has a, a site for students, which we'll send the, the link. And also at Orange Coast College, we have a student resources page and FAQs, which also we have uh, we've given that uh, website. But I think that facilitates um, you know, students navigating that and really getting to the heart of what they need right now, rather than having to go through the whole, the entire website. And I think that that's, it's timely, user-friendly information that is relevant. Um, thank you so much for that. And, um, you know, now I want to, I want to kind of transition a little bit to talk about our students that are, are either have just graduated or are about to graduate right now. And I think that the COVID-19 era, you know, we're missing the pomp and circumstance of the graduation ceremony. And for many of these kids, I mean, they are missing a, a job offer that just three months ago seemed like a certainty or in some cases they, they already had. Our, we went from a period of unprecedented economic growth and like 118 months of job growth to a serious downturn. And we're looking at 25% unemployment. It is a really, really daunting time to be graduating from college, um, you know, what are, I'd love to hear your, all of your perspectives, kind of what, what are some of the, the advice, what are some of the advice that you would offer to our recent graduates um, in terms of as they're, they're looking at their job search and they're thinking about planning the next step in their career? I'll start Lieutenant Governor, with, I'll start with you. 
Well, it's very difficult. And um, I don't want to downplay uh, the reality of the numbers that we are seeing. Um, somewhere between 18 and 25% unemployment, uh, a uh, structural changes to our economy that may be permanent, um, particularly for entry level jobs. Uh, this is going, and, and for the moment, if you're graduating right now, uh, we still haven't fully reopened and may not for many more months. Uh, it's a very difficult time. And so I think that um, what I would say to graduating seniors is, of course, be as creative as you can possibly be. Maybe look uh, and consider jobs that previously you wouldn't have considered. And I think always remember that uh, life uh, is going to be full of ups and downs, some in your personal life, some in um, the world around you where you have no control whatsoever. And this is what I hope for this generation and for my generation, and I've been around for a while, will be a once in a lifetime event, a global pandemic, unlike anything we've ever seen before, but with a global response that has been unlike anything we've ever seen before. If you go back in history to previous pandemics, there has never been an organized response like the one that the world is, is putting up against this global pandemic right now. And uh, to that end, we have already, even just in California, saved tens of thousands of lives by the communications, modern communication, and the willingness of people to trust the uh, government mandate to stay home. So, uh, so this hopefully will be one of these times in young people's lives that they will always look back on and uh, we will get through it. They will get through it. They will get a job. Their careers will move forward. Uh, but to know that when things are down, they always come back up. When things are up, probably there's going to be something out in the future that'll bring it down. But to be flexible, to be nimble, to rely on that education, not just for the technical things that you learn, but in your ability to problem solve, in your ability to use your education to be uh, an active citizen as we together, citizens, government leaders, business leaders, all work together, of course, healthcare workers and educators, all work together to get through this crisis in a way that we will come through it, uh, not just intact, but even stronger. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. And I think um, in, in the midst of this, I think it's so easy. It's so easy for it to feel overwhelming for, for so many of us. And I think realizing that we are, we're, we are all in this together, we will only get through this together and that we will emerge stronger, more resilient, better at solving problems, better at coming up with creative solutions. Um, and I, I firmly, firmly believe that as well. Um, Dr. Suarez, would love, would love your thoughts and your advice for, for our graduating students. So I, I do think that, you know, I, I recognize, we recognize what a challenge this is and what a time that we're, we're going through right now uh, as a Lieutenant Governor you know, shared. But I do think it's an opportunity for students to really look at, towards their community college. This is a time to take advantage of uh, starting their education. And um, you know, there are numerous uh, financial aid uh, programs and assistance designed to help students take advantage of, uh, of the programs at the college. So I think that you know, as, they, as they graduate, um, to, to realize that you know, they may not know what they want to major in, they may not know what their educational goal, but that we are here for them to provide them with that support, that guidance. And we may not be on site to do that kind of, uh, the support that we're used to, but we are there for them online, and that that is followed by the, the resources through financial assistance, through the two-year uh, tuition-free programs that will help them get on that path. And I think that's a, a really critical message that getting on the path is important because we will overcome the situation and we will be opening our campuses and the economy is going to recover and they will need to have that education to be, uh, to be, uh, members of the, of the economy in which they live. So I think that again, take advantage of what we offer. 
And uh, Ms. Sikaros, your what's your advice to to college students that are graduating this year that are looking for jobs? Um, you know, what would you what would you offer to them, and where would you point them? Well, my niece is a class of 2020 graduate, and what I told Paulina was that you know, she should research and look at fellowships and other internship opportunities um, to really spend her time thinking creatively about options that maybe she would not have even considered, right, as she was gearing up to just look for a full-time job. So um, the other thing I, I encourage and, and share with your audience, too, is that you know, what we did see in the last re recession is that the impact was twice as hard on those that didn't have a college education or a degree. So while it's really tough for this class of 2020 to come into this job market, let's not you know, pretend that it isn't hard and that it may not take, you know, it may take months, right, for, for our grads to find a job that can pay them um, and give them the experience that they're seeking. But the reality is that they will have those opportunities. Um, and as the economy recovers, they will be first in line in terms of that recovery. So I, I would encourage, like I encourage my niece is to, you know, look at volunteer opportunities. This may be the time to volunteer for something that you're passionate about, serve your community in ways that uh, you may not have time, have thought you would have had time before to do. And all of that helps build your resume, right? Mm -hmm. You've been at school for four or more years. Um, build your resume and volunteer opportunities are a great way to do that. And, and our, our communities are in such great need right now. So that's my advice. Yeah, that is a great point. And there is, there's an absolutely profound need all across, all across our communities in so many ways. And as you said, it's an opportunity to, to practice what you've learned, to hone your skill set, and to build your resume. Um, and There's elections happening, so maybe that's another opportunity. You know, to, you know, the to volunteer on a political campaign and um, and spend your time and energy doing something that you know you're you're passionate about and that you believe in. Yeah, and then the other, I think those are all such great points. The the thing I would add is that. You know, there are industries that are are hiring desperately right now and that have seen a huge surge because of, of this global crisis so it's things like healthcare and uh, logistics and even some technology companies um, and California I mean there's there's tons of different job sites but but California we uh, had launched a, a job site called onwardca.org as an opportunity to try kind of match job seekers with uh, some of the emerging jobs in these fields. And so I would encourage people, even just going on to that or another job site, it gives you some sense of what kind of industries are looking for people. And you can start to, as the Lieutenant Governor said, get creative about how do you match your degree, your skill set, your passions with what is, it, what is available and what's firing right now. Um, understanding that that then can be a stepping stone to that to that dream job, right? Um, and I think also the, the other thing I would just say is just stay strong, stay positive. Even, even in the best economic situation, when you're looking for a job, there's a lot of no's before you get that right yes. And so it's so important not to get discouraged, to understand uh, just how big the challenges are and to understand that the, the only way to get through it is to be, be committed and be persistent. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to the last thing I wanted to touch on, and I think Dr. Suarez, you you had even you had mentioned it earlier, is um, just the the mental health issues that so many of our students right now are are grappling with. And this was uh, there was a huge rise, I think, in in uh, mental health issues on campuses even before this pandemic. Um, so. You know, what are your thoughts on that? What again? What are some of the the, the resources and the things that you would would point students to who um, who are grappling with that right now? You know, and you're absolutely right. These were things that um, we were seeing uh, on college campuses, the, the the growing isolation that students were feeling, and obviously all of this has just been um, significantly um, impacted with our with our current situation. So one of the things that um, you know, colleges are doing, community colleges and Orange Coast College certainly is, 
making sure that we um, we have teams of of, um, of employees who are checking. We call them. Uh, I believe they're, they're basically wellness calls just to check in on students to see how they're doing. And, uh, and I think that that has been very well received because just knowing that someone is thinking about you. Uh, we also have our mental health professionals that are available. So making sure that our students have that information. Earlier I talked a little bit about the having a, a resources page that kind of um, centralizes that information. Having that available so that we can connect students not only with the uh, mental health support on the college campus, but also within your community. Um, and knowing that, you know, they're not alone and that this is part of the transition that we're going through. So, you know, in, in the transition to instruction online and ensuring that students have the, the basic needs covered of food and technology, we're also making sure that our students are, um, are, have the, the mental health resources that they need to be able to withstand this, this challenge that we're facing right now and having people check in on them. So I think that, you know, that, that's really an important aspect of what we do as community colleges is really look at that student holistically and be there to support them. That's so, that's so powerful. Um, and I, I think it's, it's so important for us just to start to, I think, to, to treat mental health with the same seriousness that, that we treat physical health, right? And um, to ensure that we are intervening before it's a crisis. Uh, so, I am so grateful to all of you again for, for joining us and for being here. Before we, we wrap up, um, would just love to, to hear sort of any closing remarks, closing thoughts, or, or parting words. Um, Michelle, uh, we will start with you. Michelle uh, Malari. <laughs> okay, just making sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you again for inviting me to this town hall. It was really such an honor to be able to represent students in this. Um, I guess my closing thoughts are just to continue to prioritize the importance of higher education for students because a lot of students to get to higher ed, they did have to sacrifice a lot. They had to sacrifice a lot of time. Um, sometimes they had to sacrifice um, working, learning. Um, and so there's only so much that we as a student government are able to provide and um, things like financial aid and even help breaking our apartment leases. These are things that would help allow students to continue to succeed because if there is a financial burden um, on students, then education no longer becomes their priority and we just continue mm -hmm. to build a cycle. So I uh, just wanted to emphasize again, the importance of supporting students financially. Thank you. And uh, Mrs. Garris, Ms. Garris. Uh, thank you, Assemblywoman, for hosting this conversation and for putting your constituents and their and supporting them as they think about what to do next in education first. I think that's critical. I think I'm going to echo Michelle's comments. I think that as we look at what we know will be a devastating budget for California, that in every decision we focus on how do we support students first? How do we ensure that they have um, the financial aid they need? How do we support our institutions to be able to deliver uh, strong uh, distance learning opportunities? And how do we also push them to improve some of the pathways for students? It has never been more important to improve the transfer pathway for community college students um, than this pandemic will, I think, um, create. So I think there's so many opportunities to really, you know, double down on the reforms to improve student outcomes at our colleges and universities that we can do and that don't cost money. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us. And Dr. Suarez, your parting, parting thoughts. Well, I echo uh, much of the sentiments that have been um, shared already. Thank you very much for hosting this town hall and, and, and the invitation to be part of this conversation. You know, I, I think that as we, um, we've all learned that this pandemic has really um, demonstrated how interconnected we are and how you know, we need to work together as, as partners, community partners, assembly women, lieutenant governor, our students, the campaign, and that Orange Coast College and our community colleges are very much part of that solution to really help our economy get back on track and really support our students. So I appreciate the, the invitation and I look forward to our continued work together. Well, thank you. And as I said, thank you for everything that you do for Orange County kids. And Lieutenant Governor, thank you for being here. Your closing remarks. 
Well, thank you so much, Kari. And again, thank you for bringing people regularly together uh, to be accessible to your constituents and to others beyond just your own district to talk about these incredibly important issues that impact our families and our kids during this health crisis and the breadth of issues that you have already addressed has just been so terrific. I, I will say this, and this is kind of writ large, um, but one of the big challenges that we have in our society is that people work so hard, they work such long hours, sometimes two jobs, three jobs. This is actually a time to um, put some things in order. Sleep eight hours at night. Uh, get your um, exercise in, spend that time with your family. And, and it, there's no question, it's a stressful time uh, on a multitude of levels. And it may get more stressful as we get further and further along into both the pandemic and the economic challenges. Um, but since we're being forced to stay at home so much, taking advantages of the ability to get in a good night's sleep, uh, to chop your own vegetables and eat a little healthier, uh, spend a little time with your family, get some exercise. I think it's important to remember that we shouldn't think of those as guilty pleasures. We have the time, most of us now, to do a little bit more of that. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I just think uh, it's a good thing to mention, particularly for our young people and our students. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you all for being here and joining us. And for everyone at home, thank you for joining us. Uh, if we weren't able to get to your question that you sent either through email or uh, on, on the Facebook stream, my team will be back in touch to, to answer your question directly. Uh, look forward to catching up with you again next week. And in the meantime, be well and stay strong.